Hi everyone, it's Heather Darnall. Welcome back to my art channel. Thank you for joining me for another video. Recently, I came back from Los Angeles and I was a part of my good friend of 19 years, 50th birthday party. So at this dinner party, what I ended up wearing, which is a dress with just cherries on it, ended up being my inspiration for today's painting. I really was just like, you know what? I love this dress. I'm so glad I finally get to wear it. It's been hanging in my closet for like a year and a half. <laughs> nowhere to go i don't know about you but i mean once you're a mom you really just don't really have a lot of places to go and so finally an opportunity arose so i can actually wear it and didn't know i was going to be inspired by my dress either but anyway so i didn't know how to uh like go about this painting do i keep it super simple do i try to do it like abstract like do i try to keep it as you know, traditional as possible and have lots of detail in there. And so I really just didn't know, like I said, how to, how to approach this painting. So if you're like me and you find yourself coming across like a stumbling block, I tend to go to Pinterest, you know, I mean, who doesn't? And so I got my inspiration from this artist named Tony Grote and this very exact painting that we're doing is basically a replica of hers. And I saw her painting on Fine Art America and I really loved it. It was um, it's it, it, obviously it has the traditional, very detail oriented aspect of it, which is the focal point being the cherries. Yet in the background is kind of abstract like, and abstract art is not really where I am strong in. And so I thought, what a perfect painting um, that I would like to try because practicing abstract is just a continuation of challenging my skill set. Um, and I loved the colors of it, and it was still pretty simple. I liked the fact that the background wasn't taking away from anything and that this is just goes beyond, even though it's a very simplistic picture or painting, it still gives enough out there to suggest it's something that's really nice that you can hang in your kitchen or something. You know what I mean? So it's not just like, oh, here's some cherries. <laughs> but anyway, so that's what I thought we would do today. But before we get started, today's ministry snack, we're actually going to go all the way back in time to the book of Genesis. Um, chapter 4 verses 1 through 16 and it reads now Adam knew Eve his wife and she conceived and bore Cain saying I have gotten a man with the help of the Lord and again she bore his brother Abel now Abel was a keeper of sheep and Cain a worker of the ground in the course of time Cain brought to the Lord an offering of the fruit of the ground and Abel also brought of the firstborn of his flock and of their fat portions and the Lord had regard for Abel and his offering but for Cain and his offering he had no regard so Cain was very angry and his face fell. The Lord said to Cain, why are you angry and why is your face fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin is crouching at the door. Its desire is contrary to you, but you must rule over it. Cain spoke to Abel, his brother, and when they were in the field, Cain rose up against his brother Abel and killed him. Then the Lord said to Cain, where is Abel, your brother? He said, I do not know, am I my brother's keeper? And the Lord said, what have you done? The voice of your brother's blood is crying to me from the ground, and now you are cursed from the ground, which has opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. When you work the ground, it shall no longer yield to you its strength. You shall be a fugitive and a wanderer on the earth. Cain said to the Lord, My punishment is greater than I can bear. Behold, you have driven me today away from the ground, and from your face I shall be hidden. I shall be a fugitive and a wanderer on the earth, and whoever finds me will kill me. Then the Lord said to him, not so. If anyone kills Cain, vengeance shall be taken on him sevenfold. And the Lord put a mark on Cain, lest anyone who found him should attack him. Then Cain went away from the presence of the Lord and settled in the land of Nod, east of Eden. Okay, so this is the time when Adam and Eve have recently been exiled from the Garden of Eden because they have foolishly chosen sin and a flawed, very limited life over perfection for eternity. So hence our current curse that we all live in today. So yay, Adam and Eve. And um, they are now living outside. And when it speaks of Adam and that he knew Eve, it is not like, well, hard. When you look at that at first, for me, it's like he knew Eve. Yeah, obviously they knew each other. So why is that noted? It is to make a very clear understanding that Adam knew Eve in, a, in an intimate way. They were husband and wife. They had sexual relations. Therefore, they had children. And so that is the context of when it says Adam knew Eve. 
Um, but when the, she bore Cain, she was all super stoked going, ah, I've got the help now from the Lord. I got a man here to, you know, bruise the head of this, you know, this enemy that's going to, you know, that, that, that basically put me in this trap and got us where we are. But she was surely disappointed going, oh, it's just Cain. <laughs> she misunderstood God because while they were in the Garden of Eden and God was basically dishing out the punishment, the specific portion of punishment to Eve, where he tells her, hey, I'm going to put enmity between you and your offspring and its seed's going to bruise its head. She didn't really understand. What God was talking about is, hey, you two wrecked everything and now Jesus has to come down and save everyone. So in due time, Jesus will come. And therefore, again, why she misunderstood God, because she thought the Messiah was coming right away. The Bible is literally a lineage of people. So it's seeds of people dating from Adam and Eve all the way down to Jesus. Because remember, the Bible is centered around Jesus. It's before, during, and after. So anyone in his direct lineage is going to be dearly noted. That's why we are able to better understand the life of Jesus and, and the history before him. Everyone else, eh, there's really just kind of gee whiz facts. And if they're not noted in there, it's because we don't need to know. We are on a need to know basis in the Bible and where it is silent that is basically saying, so should we. We have no need to expend energy to put ourselves in a rabbit hole and just come out confused anyways, because it's not meant for us to go there. But anyway, so she bore Cain, which was, uh, he was a farmer, and then she also had Abel, and he was a shepherd. Now, at the time, um, it was for, uh, the time came, and it was to give God an offering. Now, these offerings were just basically telling God, hey, thank you, um, I just want to show my gratitude, I have all my faith in you. I mean, it was really for um, just showing God the, the reciprocating relationship and love and faith for him. So. Um, while Cain was gathering fruit and food or whatever from the ground, he was doing it really half-heartedly, if that. It was just really kind of going, eh, you know, just picking up scraps. It was really more of an obligation to him. He really had no good intention with it. He was just doing it because I have to do it. You know what I mean? And God picks up on that. He picks up on everything. And so on the other hand, while Abel's over here, he's like perfectly and carefully you know, hand selecting the best, you know, um, one out of his livestock or his flock, God picked up on his genuineness and overall intention of that offering. So it's not that Abel had a better offering being meat while Cain had this lousy offering of, you know, fruit or grains or whatever, because if you're familiar with the Bible or if you're not, the Leviticus is a book in the early, te or excuse me, in the Old Testament where it speaks heavily of various types of offering, and all of them are the same. Um, and so it really just depends on where your heart is. So every type of offering that God allows, which includes grain offerings, are valid. They're legit. It's just where is your heart in the whole process of it. And that was an area where God dearly noted the intentions of both being drastically different. And so therefore he had regard for Abel and um, his offering because he didn't just give him meat, but he gave him the fat portions. And if you're thinking, well, fat's bad, it's calories and cholesterol and this and that. Uh, do you really think God's counting calories? Do you think he's counting his cholesterol levels? No. <laughs> Anyone that has worked in a restaurant business or is a chef knows that the fat of an animal it's what gives it that aroma, that flavor to it. And that makes it the best part. It's not that it's bad for your health. God isn't a person watching his health. He is not a, a human figure. We are made in his image because we were just simply an idea that he came up with. Like, oh, you know what? I'm going to make people look like this. Boom. And here we are. And so since God noticed that, he went to Cain. He's like, hey, why are you so angry? Why is your face fallen? And, you know, are you, if, if you do what's right, are you not going to be accepted? Because if you don't do what's right, sin's crouching at your door. It's going to basically swallow you alive and consume you and take over you. But you need to rule over sin. You have to take charge now. you got to put your big boy pants on and man up and take care of this. Because if you don't, there's going to be some big problems. So Cain really is just not really sitting well with that. So Cain and Abel are out in the field working, talking, whatever doesn't really specify other than they're in the field and the fact that Cain was still angry is what is the 
what is dearly noted. Uh, he is still hanging out to all kinds of jealousy and anger over this whole offering bit, which Cain could have just done right himself. He could have done it again. He could have offered again. He could have said, I'm sorry. You know what I mean? So he's still holding on to all this junk that's really just getting the best of him. And he literally rises up and takes his own brother's life. He slew him. And so God comes in. He's like, hey, Cain, where's your brother Abel? And Cain tries to pass it off and dismiss it. Like, well, since God didn't see it, I don't really have to tell him what happened because he, he doesn't know. Not so. Um, and so he's like, I don't know. Am I my brother's keeper? So God then proceeds to say, what have you done? But we tend to forget that when God asks a, asks us a question, it's not that he missed anything. It's not that he doesn't know something. It's not that he didn't, he can't figure it out without relying on us. He doesn't need us to give him any information. He knows all, sees all, hears all. He is omniscient and all powerful. He is omnip omnipotent too. So he's, he's everything. And so when he's asking us these questions, like he asked Cain, hey, where's your brother? He's really just opening a door and an opportunity for him to confess because when we confess, God has the mercy and love for us to want to forgive us. And he wants to forgive Cain here. He wants to just, you know, water under the bridge. The past is the past. Let's move forward and do good. But Cain was just still continuously dismissing him and just really didn't have any kind of care about the whole thing. So God then proceeds to call him out on his junk. He's like, hey, what have you done? You know, the blood, the blood of your brother is crying to me from the earth in which you spilled it on. And now the same earth that you, that has your brother's blood, it's going to be cursed. You are not going to get the same kind of food at the yield that you're used to. You are not going to meet all kinds of friends and have a good time and, you know, call it good in one spot. You are going to be a wanderer. You're going to be a fugitive. You're going to have to work super hard now. So all because of your hand and your doing, these are the consequences. And we tend to forget that when we don't welcome the wisdom and the um, grace of our father, we are welcoming consequences instead. And then we have the audacity to go, but why? And so now, now that Cain's facing the consequences, oh, but God, this is too much for me. I can't take this. I can't bear it. Funny how God picked up on his actual genuineness of his plea in that case too because he did know that that was a pretty harsh punishment, but he wasn't gonna make it as harsh as Cain interpreted it to be. Therefore, came back and said, no, it's not what you think it is. You are marked because you are marked under my protection and anyone who does anything otherwise to you is gonna be held accountable in such a way that they can't even grasp. So you're okay. So when we um, dismiss God, we're inviting ourselves for problems, it's our own fault, and then or we like to blame somebody else and really come up with the lamest excuses of why it's someone else's fault. Like, well, it, um, if, if you weren't snoring so loud, I would be refreshed enough to remember that I had to take the trash out. So that's why I didn't take the trash out. It's because you snore too loud. I mean, do you see there's really no logic in there? Kind of like when Adam said to God, well, yeah, but you gave me Eve and because of her, I ate the fruit. That was not Eve's fault. That was Adam's fault. He's a big boy. He could make his own decisions, but he tried to pass it off too. And that's our problem. We like to pass off our fault onto somebody else. Blame somebody else for our stupid choices, you know, our foolishness. So the bottom line is when we do things, we need to do things with the whole heart. Because if anything less than that, they are just discounted, they're void, they're worthless. And God picks up on that. He knows our hearts yet we act like we can fool him and when right when we think we have fooled him he calls us out on our junk you guys and then we're like oh yeah but yeah but and then he comes back with your well take your yeah buts and here's what i think of that and he again spills out the consequences and or the truth along with that and we really just need to put away our pride and stop being so stubborn and ask for forgiveness confess our sins really just think about how we can make things better ourselves if we chose to live you know in right standing with god he is the one who always is by our side his hand is always holding ours it's our hand that lets go of his and then we go why did you go astray he's like well my hand's been here the whole time you're the one who let go of me but i still love you so much and i will welcome your hand back so really just think about our sin 
if we are letting it take control over our life or if we are welcoming the Holy Spirit in and controlling our life in a way we are going to be blessed in more ways than we can count. Now, again, so we don't have to, don't think of that God is going to puppet us. You know, we are not robots. He didn't create us to be some little technical thing and have a an, an illegit, counterfeit, fake, loving relationship. He made us so that we can love him back because he loved us first. All right, guys, let's get started. I'm beginning my project drawing in darker lines of my pre-sketch drawing of cherries in the background. You'll see that I start on the left side about a quarter of the way down and going in a gradual decline. And then right about the midpoint, I make a small mound and go up about as much as I came down. Next, just above the halfway point, I start another curve that goes up and across to the other side and bring it down to the same point on the left. For the cherries, I begin with the one in the back that's slightly higher than the midpoint of the canvas, making it a little bit bigger than my fist as well as giving it a little dip on the top where the stem will be, which is where and why I draw in the little circle. For the cherry on the left, I make it sort of heart-shaped at the top. Just make soft mounds and keep the body mostly circular. No little circle for this one for the stem because it's going to stand completely upright. For the last cherry on the right, this one is basically a circle because it will be laying on its side. And the circle where the stem will be is kind of off-center towards the bottom left. I draw in the bottom line for the background cherry and then another line where the top of the shadow line will be, followed by a couple of semicircle lines along the edges beneath the cherries, kind of like parentheses marks. Lastly, I start another shadow line a little over an inch below the cherry on the left and then gradually bring it over to the cherry on the right, but only bring it up to the bottom line. For the background, I'm using my number 8 bright brush, filling it in with a combination of light purple, significantly softened up with titanium white. So in other words, I simply brought the tint down. You'll see that I keep that color pretty much in the center and then add some neutral gray number 5 along the sides, where I also brought the color down by adding titanium white as well. I'm merely just slapping these colors on. There really is no special way to do this part as it's sort of a smudgy look type thing anyways. I'm basically doing a lot of quick back and forth brush strokes. Take note that I also add a touch of Mars Black as well, but don't completely blend it in all the way. I want some specks in there for contrast. For the bottom portion of this section, I switch brushes to my number six flat shader using Burnt Umber. Notice it's thicker on the right side and pretty slim on the left, followed by Mars Black. Take note I'm doing a lot of dry brushing here, which is when I don't have a lot of paint on my brush, so it doesn't go very far and merely just gives a suggestion of the color. Basically, you can still see some patches of the white fibers on the canvas, which helps add to the overall abstract look to it in the background that will be carried through throughout the rest of the background of this painting. You'll see that I soften up the right side some, but you can make it as heavy or as light in color as you'd like. I just think I went a little bit too heavy myself, so I tried to correct my colors. Still using the same brush, I'm now filling in the little section on the right with titanium white with trace amounts of Mars Black.
Okay, for the left side, I'm gonna try to make as much sense as possible. And well, I mean, I hope I make sense anyways, but hopefully what you see me demonstrating, it'll just speak for itself. But you'll notice that I do fill it all the way across with titanium white followed by a combination of medium magenta and burnt umber. Notice that the wet titanium white keeps it pretty soft or lighter in color, and that I don't take it up all the way on the left. I leave like a little gap there. And that the coloring is heavier on the bottom left side than on the right. I fill the top portion up on the left with light pink. However, I also significantly brought the tint down as well using titanium white. Lastly, I add a touch of light purple to the bottom left side, followed by a smidgen of Mars black for contrast. For the next portion of the background, I go back to my number eight bright brush using a combination of light pink and titanium white. So remember earlier when using white with any color, you're essentially bringing the tint down. But anyway, you'll see I'm applying this color in the same fashion as I was on the top to keep it consistent, just quickly going back and forth. I'm not doing anything special, which is nice because it doesn't take a lot of time. Remember the focal point will be the cherries, not the background. The background colors are just meant to complement the cherries. So again, don't focus on any specific details in this portion, just the overall coloring. Now I'm adding a little bit of a cadmium yellow deep hue mixed with a touch of burnt umber because to me the yellow itself is too bright. And you'll see I keep it mostly on the left and right sides of the cherries but more heavily on the left side and then tone it down again with some more white. Now along the bottom sections, I do some more dry brushing with a little bit of neutral gray number five that is again, mixed with some titanium white. Hopefully by now you'll see that the whole objective is to keep the background colors, or most of them, as subtle or as muted as possible. Otherwise these colors would just clash with the cherries and just be too busy. Or at least that's my opinion. And of course, always remember to make anything the way you like it. It doesn't always have to be exactly like someone else's unless you like everything you see. Then by all means, go for it. Either way, you're still practicing and more importantly, you're enjoying yourself in the process. Here I'm just going along a few areas again to brighten them up or tone it down with a little bit of titanium white. Now onto these cherries. 
So I'm still using the same brush, but I'm filling it in with the Napfall Crimson and a little bit of a primary red, although I didn't see much of that color. So I'd say you'd be fine without it, honestly, but I fill it in with a couple of coats. You can do one coat if you want, but it won't dry to its true color. So I'm only suggesting to use two to three to get that darker shade because unfortunately, working with a white surface, it tends to bring the color down a shade or two, but it also keeps your artwork nice and bright. So I guess what I'm trying to say, that's the good and bad. So hopefully here you can see the true color of the Napfall Crimson after a couple of coats, but notice it's still wet, which is great for blending, because I'm now adding Mars Black for shadowing, which will mostly be along the left side of the cherry and a little bit along the bottom right side as well. Here I switched to my number six round blender brush and I'm using a little bit of titanium white for highlights along the top and the right side as well, but I don't go down all the way. You'll notice it doesn't change the overall color much, but I also go back to use a little bit of Mars Black. When I use this brush, I like to dab the paint in as well as going back and forth or up or down. That's the beauty of this brush. It's really versatile. It blends in many ways. Anyway, you'll see me go back and forth between the two brushes using red and the black as well, but I'm really just trying to get it to my liking. Shading is a more advanced skill, so don't get too frustrated with it. It does take more time to get everything the way you want it. Back to more titanium white, you'll see I add a smidgen of that on the top left side for more highlights. Here I'm just dabbing in the highlighted spots, which one is on the top left, two larger ones on the right, followed by another small one just below the two. For the center cherry, I'm filling most of it in using Mars Black for shadowing with my number six flat shader brush, and of course for the cherry itself, more Napal Crimson.
Again, you'll see here the difference with multiple coats of red, but now I'm also using more Mars Black, making a little semicircle around where the stem will be, as well as another small shaded area on the top left there as well. Back to my number six round blender brush, I get some more titanium white and use for highlights along the top right section. You'll also notice I bounce back and forth between all three colors of red, black, and white. Again, just making tweaks and or additions as I see needed that are to my liking.
Onto the last cherry, you'll pretty much see by now it's a repeated process of using a couple of coats. And with the shadowing in the highlights, although you'll see that the cherry is mostly shadowed due to facing away from any light. And be sure to leave a very thin outline of red along the left side so that the background cherry doesn't get lost with the one on the right. For that skinny little section under the cherry in the middle, I fill it in with the primary red using my number one filbert brush, followed by a little titanium white underneath. Onto the bottom section, hopefully you'll see in this area that I make a small portion with that muted light pink color. But don't worry about making perfect lines, just make it sort of triangular in shape. You'll see where it plays in shortly. Now back to using my bright brush and the same colors and mix at the top section, which is light purple, titanium white, and neutral gray number five, still keeping the pattern consistent. You'll see that I sort of made two soft circles and that will act as the shadowing, but hopefully you'll also notice that where the pink comes through too, so that this part of the background comes together nicely.
For the upper shadow line, I go back to my medium magenta and burnt umber mix, but this time I don't have any white yet. <laughs> I want to keep it darker. I mean, obviously I'm going for a shadowed look, although I do add a little bit of the titanium white back in it to soften the colors up some, but then you'll see I add more of my mixed color so that there's sort of two sections of shadowing. This is that little portion of that second shadowing area I was talking about, and you'll see it's still mixed color, but mostly burnt umber. This is a third shadowed area, and it's the same mixture, but I'll also add some Mars Black to both the primary shadowed areas, but mainly right underneath the two cherries in front. Onto the stems, I switch brushes to my number one filbert using a light olive green as the base color. Take note, I'm using the edge of my brush to get a thin line, although you can probably use any small round detail brush too. You'll see the back cherry stems go straight up and then about halfway, they curve in opposite directions going at about a 45 degree angle, while the stem in the front goes down at a 45 degree angle as well, but then curves up ending just outside the purple shadow line. Next, I apply some raw sienna to give it more of a natural stem color combined with the light olive green, followed by trace amounts of titanium white and burnt umber for highlights and contrast.
Here I'm using raw sienna again, but I'm making little triangular shaped tips for the ends of the stems with some burnt umber and Mars black as well as titanium white. Okay, so here it is. Wow, look at those. I just I just want to stuff those in my face. <laughs> I really, I love how they look so clear and realistic while the background is soft with more of an abstract look to it. I think it's such a nice balance of the two types of styles of painting. And anyway, all my paints and supplies are listed in the description if you'd like to try it for yourself. And a thought in case you're not a fan of cherries. I think you could just simply leave off the stems and that these would easily come across as some really nice apples too. So up to you. So that concludes this lesson or demo. And if you liked it, please be sure to not only share it, but to also hit like and subscribe for more videos. Liking and subscribing tells YouTube to share with other people with like-minded interests. So be helpful. <laughs> but more importantly, remember to thank God for this opportunity and always paint from the soul. See you next time. Bye.